2014 was a phenomenal year for films. Obviously, I didn't get a chance to see everything, but here are all the films I saw, and now we're gonna jump into this list. So let's go. Birdman is an excellent exploration of our current culture and art and entertainment. The film follows Michael Keaton playing a washed up actor who previously was known as a rather iconic superhero. Birdman. In case you didn't already catch on, the film's a little self-aware, casting a handful of actors who have been running with superhero films. So Keaton's character is trying to make a comeback with a play on Broadway. And actually, the way the film is presented is a rather clever fusion of theater and film. You see, Emmanuel Lebeski was cinematographer on this film, and he's a dude who loves his long takes. So much so that the film is presented as one long, continuous take. And in doing so, the film becomes closer to a play as there aren't any edits to splice together performances, which in turn showcases how good all these actors are. Put those great performances with some awesome camera work and lighting, and then when you take into account the subject matter, some of the abstraction in the film, and the relative open ending, well you've got the entertaining and thought-provoking film that is Birdman. The one I love is a weird little indie film that had me hooked from the trailer. Elizabeth Moss and Mark Duplass are going through couples therapy and trying to make it work. Their therapist recommends a vacation home, but the thing unique about this vacation home is the guest house. Whenever one of them goes into the guest house, they encounter the idealized version of the other person, and the film becomes an interesting deconstruction of the relationship, and then just becomes weirder from there. I will admit the film's end gets a little outlandish and a tad predictable, but it's still an incredibly humorous and well-performed film, making it an off-kilter favorite favorite of mine this year. Snowpiercer is continuing an interesting trend in Hollywood of having South Korean directors now directing the Hollywood Fair. In 2013, we saw it with Kim Jin-woon in The Last Stand, and then Chan Wook Park with Stoker. And now we have Jun Ho Bong writing and directing Snowpiercer. I know you're all super tired of that standard story of a climate change experiment gone awry, so everybody has to get on board a train that's constantly circling the Earth, but Snowpiercer takes a really fun spin on it. The film is well acted across the board, with Chris Evans leading the charge, but he's also joined by the South Korean actor King Ho Song, who is an absolute rock star and has worked with the two other directors I listed, and he previously worked with Jun Ho Bong in The Host. Also killing it in The Snowpiercer, Tilda Swinton just is absolutely weird and wonderful in this film, and Alison Pill has a brief but very memorable appearance. From characters to the world with the unique settings on the train car to awesome action sequences, Snowpiercer is an absolutely dynamite ride that you'll be glad to take again and again. Guardians of the Galaxy is that character-driven space adventure that none of us really knew how much we wanted until it was right in front of us. Yes, Marvel's been delivering hit after hit, but Guardians struck many as a complete oddball on the roster. But in being unfamiliar to us, it actually made Guardians incredibly accessible. And it certainly was helpful to be ushered into this world so graciously by the writer and director of this film, James Gunn. For those unfamiliar, he previously directed Super and Slither, both of which are significantly darker and weirder than Guardians. But the universe of Guardians is weird in its own right. I mean, the ensemble on paper is just bonkers. Like at the very least, an eyebrows raised with Bradley Cooper voicing a raccoon and Vin Diesel voicing a tree. Although I will say if there's anyone to voice a tree, it's Vin Diesel. I mean, he kills it in Iron Giant. And from the Fast and the Furious movies, we know that he's a dude who's all about family. So him caring for a group totally translates. Then you've got Dave Bautista playing the dumb but loyal Drax. Zoe Saldana seems to really love space, and while her character is dealt a lot of the exposition, she plays an excellent straight man and is a convicted kick-ass character. And then there's Chris Pratt, who I've loved ever since Parks and Rec. The dude's got comedy chops, but he can also lean into those dramatic roles as we've seen in Moneyball and Zero Dark Thirty. The dude's just blowing up, and I couldn't be more excited for him. That said, of all the cast, I am a little disappointed with the villain. It seems to be a trend, with the exception of Loki, Marvel hasn't had a really exciting bad guy. And I understand that perhaps some of that might be a result that he needs to be linked to Thanos in some regard, and that interconnected worldness makes him need to be more toned down. I just feel bad for Lee Pace, although I do have faith that Ultron will be written by Joss Whedon as both charismatic and chaotic. Here's to hoping. Bouncing back to things I like, the soundtrack in Guardians is just kick-ass. There's really nothing quite like a swashbuckling space adventure with comedy hitting on a variety of levels all topped off with rock and roll tunes. Guardians of the Galaxy is just a perfect concoction of fun. It just goes to show that you can have success in Hollywood when you take a few risks, even if that risk is based on a previously but relatively unknown IP. But like, please Hollywood, make more original stuff. The Theory of Everything is not your usual biographical drama. Yes, it does focus on Stephen Hawking's studies and his struggles with ALS, but at the core of this film is actually his relationship with his first wife, Jane Wilde. In Theory of Everything, it is all about this relationship, and the dynamic between Eddie Redmayne and Felicity Jones is absolutely magnificent. Felicity Jones is compelling as Jane Wilde, playing both committed yet conflicted at times. It's those little ticks and looks that she gives in scenes that just bring her performance to a whole nother level, and Redmayne completely transforms to become 
Hawking. He plays both charming and tortured as we see him physically deteriorate, his speech becoming increasingly unintelligible. I was absolutely blown away by this performance. The theory of everything is just such a wonderful turn on what you'd expect from a Stephen Hawking biography. The film keeps an excellent balance, presents us with magical cinematography, and doesn't sugarcoat our two main characters. We see their struggles and triumphs, the humor and drama that comes with their marriage. It's an excellent look into their lives, informing you both about the universe and the human condition. Selma is a masterfully put together period piece, focusing on the civil rights movement in 1964, spearheaded by Martin Luther King Jr.'s peace protests in Selma, Alabama. The battle between MLK and LBJ of who would blink first. David Oyelowo's portrayal of MLK is absolutely spellbinding. He nails inflection, mannerisms, and only serves further proof that Brits play better historical American figures. And the entire cast and aesthetic of this film, it's all so honed and focused. This is actually my first exposure to director Ava DuVernay, but man. I am impressed and cannot wait to see what she does next. Of course, what we see in the film Selma is also incredibly relevant today. While many would like to believe that racism no longer exists because Crash won Best Picture, we see time and time again that prejudices are still very prevalent. So Selma allows us to see how far we've come and see how much farther forward we can go. Whiplash is an excellent indie flick showcasing powerhouse performances from Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons. And actually, in 2014, I didn't do a ton of reviews, but I did do a review on Whiplash. So to not repeat myself, I figure in this slot, why don't I give you four honorable mentions? Number one, still Alice offers Julianne Moore at her absolute best. It's her with early onset Alzheimer's and yeah, it is a rough watch. The whole idea about Alzheimer's, dementia, all that, losing your unit, it freaks me out. The rest of the cast is great, but this is clearly a vehicle for more. And really, it's Julianne Moore. What else could you ask for? Number two, sticking with the tragic trend, The Fault in Our Stars is a romance between two teenage cancer patients. Shanley Woodley and Ansel Elgort have absolutely excellent chemistry. And while some might view the plot a bit contrived, everything about these characters and their discussions feels a few strides ahead from A Walk to Remember. It's just a well-told bit of young love under bizarre circumstances that'll leave you misty-eyed. Number three, all right, let's shake off those somber feels right now and throw in some explosions. John Wick is Keanu Reeves coming back to the action genre, and it's just a fun film. The story clips along, the action is slick, and the world surrounding John Wick is really cool. I'm a dude who loves a world with rules, and John Wick offers that and then some. Number four, if you like The Raid, chances are you'll like The Raid too. It's just as intense and off the wall, but it's exploded out into the rest of the world now. Action scenes are happening in prisons, in cars, in kitchens, it's everywhere. The last 30 minutes are just an absolute blur of blood. That said, some, including myself, might have a few gripes at how much story is placed on this one, making for the film to feel a bit uneven. But as far as martial arts films are concerned, you really can't beat The Raid. And there you go, four honorable mentions. So sadness, sadness, action, action, Whiplash is really great. Nightcrawler is a film that I knew that I would love. You see, my favorite film of all time is Network, which is all about television, media, the sensationalism and numbers around the whole thing. And with that being a similar subject matter in Nightcrawler, but paired with an American Psycho sort of character, I knew that I was going to enjoy myself. And yes, I was right. Jake Gyllenhaal is both magnetic and terrifying at the same time. He's this hyper-focused sociopath who just wants to build an empire, and so he's willing to do somewhat unspeakable things just to get a good shot. He's just this slick, creepy, eloquently spoken wolf, and the movie serves to be a tense character study as he slowly manipulates his way to the top. Nightcrawler is just such a wonderful and yet horrible look at the media, but once you take that look, you just can't turn away. The Lego Movie is a movie for everyone. I mean, really, who hasn't played with Legos? They're almost ubiquitous with childhood. And The Lego Movie contains this youthful creativity to it while never feeling like a commercial. It's fun and fast-paced, and the comedy's hitting on all cylinders. The tale is simple, yes, but it's the way the story is executed that makes The Lego Movie so cool. First of all, the style of animation just rings so true to me. The whole thing feels like it's a clicky stop-motion brick film, and almost all the elements of the universe are constructed of Lego bricks. It's that attention to detail that really really makes the Lego movie shine. And of course it doesn't hurt that the voice talent on this film is phenomenal. And actually, really strangely, when looking at the voice talent, I noticed that many of the key roles were voiced by actors who have had NBC shows, and those who haven't have had multiple run-ins with Batman or a Charlie Day. What I also love about the Lego movie is its overall message. However, to properly address this, I am going to be talking slight spoilers, so if you want to skip that, click right here, jump past those spoilers.
We all good? Great. Let's go. What's so cool to me about the lesson in the Lego movie is that it's saying that there's a time and place for each following the instructions and being creative. And it's especially true when you take a step back and get into that live action sequence. Which, I will say, I think myself and many saw coming, but it really does work. And if you're looking for more slightly dramatic performances from Will Ferrell, I definitely encourage you to check out Stranger Than Fiction. It's great. And in a larger sense, we can see that in life, there isn't an instruction manual to make sure that everything is is awesome. Sometimes we need to look around and build our own opportunities. The Lego Movie isn't saying that following the instructions is bad by any means, but that there should be a balance between those two ideas. When Warner Brothers initially approached Lego about making this film, Lego stated they wanted nothing less than a Pixar quality film, and holy heck does this movie deliver. The entire project has been handled with so much passion by the entire creative team, and the Lego Movie is looking both forward and back, acknowledging its long history of creativity and playing well into the future. Boyhood may come off as a bit gimmicky, but that shouldn't detract from how amazing it actually is. The director of this piece, Richard Linklater, is known for pushing the boundaries of how a film can be presented and how it can be made. Such has been the case with the Before trilogy, Waking Life, Scanner Darkly, but shooting a film over the course of 12 years to actually capture the growth of a character is beyond ambitious. Each year is a perfect time capsule for Eller Coltrane, who plays our main character, Mason, and we get to see a more real and raw glimpse into this character's life. And if you think that that format is crazy and interesting to be filming with, I definitely encourage you all to check out the Up series. It started back in 1964 with 7 Up, and it subsequently had a follow-up every seven years, checking in with all those kids as they've grown up. The last one was 56 Up in 2012, and it's just very cool to be seeing how the ideologies and personas of these people change as they grow. And Boyhood is that, but on a slightly smaller and fictional scale. It's just so awesome getting to watch somebody grow up like that. And Coltrane's performance is solid throughout. His parents in the film are played by Patricia Arquette and Ethan Hawke. If you're familiar with Linklater, Ethan Hawke being in this is absolutely no surprise, but he's always so charming. I mean, him and Julie Delpy in the entire Before trilogy, they're just... the chemistry. It's... So good. Regarding plot, we're not given a serious through line. Instead, we're seeing a handful of events in this child's life, but all of which are shaping him into the person that he's going to be. So if you're looking for tense drama, you certainly aren't going to find it here. In fact, being a Linklater film, you're going to get occasional meandering conversations and philosophy thrown at you. So boyhood is definitely not for everybody, but if you've ever grown up, it might just ring true to you. So that's like most of you, unless you're in stasis or something. Those are my top 10 movies of 2014. Leave your top 10 in the comments down below. And of course, if you'd like more from me, you can check out previous reviews. Like, hey, there's my full review on Whiplash. Or if you've got a little more time on your hands, you can check out my movie talk series. In that one, we're talking about Speed Racer. And of course, you're always welcome to follow on Twitter, like on Facebook, or if any of you are looking to make a top 10 video or start movie reviews of your own, then check out lynda.com slash belatedmedia. You'll get a 10-day free trial for over 3,000 courses on programs like After Effects, Premiere, Photo shop. If you're curious about cameras, animation, web design, they've totally got you covered. So click that link down in the description, lynda.com slash belated media, start your 10-day free trial, and not only will you be learning something, but you'll also be helping out the show. So we both win. So comment, click, and keep loving movies. As for me, well, we're all going to get to see me grow up in a boyhood-like fashion. Here we go. Sorry that this isn't video. I just wanted to show myself from six to the age 18. And now we're past all the cute growing up photos. Like it's me growing my hair out a little longer than I really should and dealing with acne. Like, it's just, this hair, it's so curly, and, and I'm just doing weird stuff with it. And then the senior portrait. Ugh. Oh, God. <laughs>